we, uh, we'll get used to this, maybe, maybe not. Maybe we'll just go back to the old routine. But every once in a while, I like to do things differently, you know, so that, um, well, we don't get into a rut. Do you know I really, there's a path from here to my home. There's a certain, there's only two ways really to go. And boy, I get bored with both of them. You know, I don't, I just do not like to go the same way all the time. I don't know why. Curious, maybe. Maybe a bit of nosy. But the reality of it is, beloved, when you hear this message you're going to see how the Holy Spirit has control of our services. Our sister chose those songs. I texted her yesterday. She chose those songs. And they fit perfectly into this message. I couldn't have picked better. Well, I, I couldn't because I don't have the gifting that our sister has. But, you know, on the other hand, we all have a gifting, beloved, and we all work together in the body. Can I ask you something? On October 23rd, Sunday evening, is we're, we're planning on having a presentation with the Cashmans. that have been here before. It's in your bulletin. Some of you look at the pictures. Oh, yeah, I remember them. They're going to be here again. Can I ask how many of you are planning on being here? Uh, can I ask how many of you are planning on inviting someone else to come with you? Amen. Okay, we're going to go through with it. Please. Uh, you know, we need, they're coming from Nashville, man. You know, so we got to give, and they're coming for an offering. And I just went out to Missouri. I know how much it costs. So uh, if you could, please, uh, we're hoping, don't take it out of your tithe. <laughs> oh boy, we are right on the cusp. That chairlift slapped us hard, boy. But that's okay, God's got it all in control. Uh, a farmer pruned his apple trees early in the spring or whenever it's proper to, trim your, to prune your apple trees, and piled the branches up next to the barn, intending to use them for another purpose during the summer. He noticed within a couple of days there was this little bird trying to build a nest. That bird worked all day long on that nest inside of those cut branches. At the end of the day, when the farmer went by, he pulled the nest out of there and stomped it all into the ground. Next day, the little bird did the exact same thing. And so did the farmer. On the third day, the farmer came out his back door, and as the screen door slammed, he noticed the bird flew out of the rose bush that was a couple of feet away from the back door. And she had decided now to build her nest in the rose bush. He took great joy in that. Little chick, little bird, laid her eggs and mothered them, kept them warm. They hatched them later on and they all flew away and had a great time. And he burned up the branches that were next to the barn. Now that little bird... You know, she had no idea what's going on. All she's thinking is, look at this mean old farmer stomping on my nest. Every time I go through all the trouble to build this thing, he stomps on it. That's all she knew. When she found, when that little bird started building that nest in a rose bush and he didn't do anything, she probably thought she escaped his notice or something. You know, well, phew, finally I'm going to get this done. When all the while, the farmer was working on her behalf, wasn't he? Sometimes, beloved, God stomps on our nests. But it's not for evil. It's always for God, for good. We need to understand that. Scarecrows. Scarecrows. Would you turn with me to Isaiah chapter 36? I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, that, I don't, that shouldn't say Hezekiah. I, 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 I. 
you got to pray for your pastor. I need rest. <laughs> Isaiah, Isaiah 36 and 37. Oh my, do I feel silly right now. We're going to talk about Hezekiah is what we're going to do. Hezekiah is king of Israel. And Hezekiah has been doing good things for, for the people of, of Israel. He's in his 14th year of his reign. When suddenly, well, probably not so suddenly, they probably knew he was coming. A guy named Rabshakeh, a general under King Sennacherib of Assyria, shows up. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. And we ask you, Father, in Jesus' name, to help us now to see that you will protect us from the Sennacherib's and the Rabshakars and the Assyrians in our time. That Lord, you are the God that knows all things and you know better than we know. And Lord, we ask you in Jesus' name that you would just give me wisdom and give me your words. And Lord, bless your people as we look into this time. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, I wonder if uh, when Mary and Joseph were going down to, to Jerusalem for the Passover and she started to get in good labor and the water broke, I wonder if it came across Joseph's mind, right now, God? Really? Right now? Or when, when God woke them up and told them, get out of town because... Uh, Herod's going to do something bad. I wonder if Joseph thought, well, why don't you just stop Herod? I mean, why do I got to move, you know? Why don't you just stop Herod? Do you ever think stuff like that? I think this is, keep that in the back of your mind as we, we look into this. Beginning in chapter 36, of Isaiah verse four, it's quite, it's quite a long reading, so please bear with me. Then Rabshakeh, by the way, Rabshakeh is there to attack Jerusalem, to take it over. He, they, he wants to take over uh, Judah and Israel. And so uh, Rabshakeh said to them, say now to Hezekiah, thus says the great king, the king of Assyria, what confidence is this which you trust? I say to you, speak of having, I say, you speak of having counsel and strength for war, but they are vain words. Now in whom do you trust that you rebel against me? Look, you are trusting in the staff of this broken reed Egypt on which if a man leans, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who trust in him. But if you say to me, we trust in the Lord our God, is it not he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah has taken away and said to Judah and Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar? Now therefore I urge you, give a pledge to my master, the king of Assyria, and I will give you 2,000 horses if you are able on your part to put riders on them. How then will you repel one captain of the least of my master's servants and put your trust in Egypt for chariots and horses? Have I now come up without the Lord against this land to destroy it? The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. Then Eliakim and Shibna, Joash, said to Rabshakeh, please speak to your servants in the Aramaic language, for we understand it. And do not speak to us in Hebrew in the hearing of the people who are on the wall. But Rabshakeh says, has my master sent me to your master and you to speak these words and not to the men who sit on the wall who will eat and drink their own waste with you? Then the Rabshakeh stood and called out with a loud voice in Hebrew and said, Hear the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus says the king, Do not let Hezekiah deceive you, for he will not be able to deliver you. 
nor let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, the Lord will surely deliver us. This city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Do not listen to Hezekiah, for thus says the king of Assyria, make peace with me by a present and come out to me. And every one of you will eat from his own vine and every one from his own fig tree. And every one you, of you drink the waters from your own cistern until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of grain and new wine and a land of bread and vineyards. Beware lest Hezekiah persuade you, saying the Lord will deliver us. As any one of the gods of the nations delivered its land from the hand of the king of Assyria, where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where's the gods of Sepharvaim? Indeed, have they delivered Samaria from my hand? Who among all the gods of this land have delivered their countries from my hand? That the Lord should deliver Jerusalem from my hand. This guy's in trouble, and he don't even know it. Did you hear that? Did you listen to it? He's telling them, I'm coming in and I'm taking over, and there isn't any way you're going to stop me. Don't, don't, don't even be deceived by Hezekiah. Well, these other guys telling you that God will keep me from it. Oh, no, no, no. Where are the other gods? In fact, he actually told me, he actually says in the beginning that the Lord sent me here to take you, to destroy you. Whew. Just look at 37.1. And so it was when King Hezekiah heard it that he tore his clothes, covered himself with sackcloth, and went into the house of the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Hezekiah is smarter than we think. He's not going to try and persuade the people. He's going to let the, people, the, the Lord do that. Hezekiah turns to the Lord. God's going to rescue them. He's going to. In fact, Rabshakeh is going to hear about some news, and he's going to leave. Yeah. He's not going to take the army with him, though. He's only going to take some. And he's going to go because he hears what's happening to his king, Sennacherib, up in a place called Libna, Lakesh. <laughs> that's, what, that's what's going to happen. Because God tells them in verse 7 of chapter 37, surely I will send a spirit upon him. And he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land. And I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. Who? Well, Sennacherib, the king who sent Rabshakeh. But that's not our focus. Our focus is, is that Jerusalem is surrounded by this army, 185,000. And they've, in fact, they were already warned in Isaiah not to turn to Egypt. But they did call for Egypt, but Egypt never came to help them. Sometimes that's what happens. We turn to another direction. Instead of to him first, instead of to the Lord first, we turn in another direction too swiftly. And we count on our help coming from whatever that is. And then it doesn't come. <laughs> so here they are surrounded. Hezekiah probably knows Egypt's not coming. That's why he talks about the horses. I'll give you 2,000 horses if you can put a rider on them. He knows they can't put a rider on them. And he's doing it because Egypt promised chariots and horses, but they're not coming. Do you ever think your help was going to come from one direction only to discover it came from a completely other direction? 
usually unexpected, surprising, and maybe even completely unknown to you until that very moment. Beloved, that's God. Listen, I'm not trying to say we shouldn't try and do what our responsibilities are to get ourselves out of a struggle or, or, a, or a problem. Of course we should. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't explore various avenues. What I'm saying is we should go to the Lord first, immediately. He'll keep us from a whole mess of time and trouble and so on. Move down to verse 10. <clears throat> Rabshakeh goes, but he sends a letter. And he sends this to Hezekiah. This is the letter. Thus you shall speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Do not let your God, in whom you trust, deceive you. <laughs> saying, Jerusalem will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Look, you have heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all the lands by utterly destroying them. And will you be delivered? Have the gods of these nations delivered those whom my fathers have destroyed? Gozan, Haran, Rezif, and the people of Eden who were in Telassa? Where is the king of Hamath and the king of Arpet and the king of the city of Sepharvaim, Hena and Ava? And Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. Hezekiah went into the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. And then Hezekiah prayed. O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cherubim, you are God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. And hear all the words of Sennacherib, who has sent to reproach the living God. Truly, Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste all the nations and their lands. And have cast their gods into the fire. For they were not gods, but the work of man's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they have destroyed them. Now therefore, O Lord, our God, save us from his hand. Let all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you are the Lord, you alone. Whew. He cries out to the Lord. He knows there's no help anywhere else. Well, the Lord sends a reply. But what we want to consider is verse 36. Then the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of Assyria 185,000. And when the people arose early in the morning, there were the corpses all dead. By the way, Sennacherib went home and his own sons killed him, murdered him. Beloved, there are times when you and I go through challenges and we stay firm and devoted to our faith and the world thinks we're foolish. The world thinks, oh, what are you doing? You should do this, you should do that, you should do this, you should do... And, and reality is, is we know better. We know our God can handle anything. He knows what's going on in our life. And sometimes he just wants to, needs to crush the nest so that we go someplace better. And sometimes that better place is in our spirit. I watched these poor souls lining up to kiss a dead, rotting heart. I'm thinking to myself, they mutilated this poor guy. They mutilated his body. 
And then I watched this young fella stand interviewed by the camera, by the news media. We commit our devotion to Saint so-and-so, and now we know that we can pray to him. If Saint so-and-so was really a saint and he could see what's going on in here, he'd be appalled. How foolish people are. I don't know how many of you read the sign, but I think that's one of the most profound signs I've ever put up there. And I've been changing that sign every 10 days now for 14 years. I've put some pretty good statements on that sign. Kiss a dead heart or love a living savior. You choose. And to love him is to trust him. It's to rely on him. In the midst of our struggle, even, for, even when the world says we're foolish, even when the world says, what are you doing? You know, you need to do this, or you need to do that, or you need to, you know. And most of the time, they're, they're telling you to do something that you know would offend your God. And when you say that, they say, are you kidding? What are you going to do? You need to get out of this. Hmm. First Corinthians. By the way, I, the scarecrow. The world tries to get us to be scared, to frighten us. But the reality of it is, is what did we do? What did I do? These crows are wise. They know that that scarecrow don't mean nothing. It's just a way to purge so that we can pick out the best corn. The fact of the matter is, beloved, is that the devil is under our feet. Did you know that? Did you, did you realize that? If we're Christian, if you're trusting, if you're not trusting in God, the devil's your master. Oh, no. he's very powerful. He's very crafty. He's very cunning, and he knows how to manipulate your very weakness. You hear me at home? But if you come to God and you ask for redemption and forgiveness and you allow the Holy Spirit to come in, the devil has no power, no authority, and no plan that he ever schemes up can prosper unless you submit to him. Some crows are flying around and saying, oh, I can't go down there. There's a person there. <laughs> but other crows are going, eh, right. Go ahead, go on, fly on to the next field. We'll save this one for us. <laughs> Beloved, 1 Corinthians, we're being made in the image of God. We're image bearers, you and I. Not, not in our appearance, but in our spirit, in our character. And when the world looks at us and sees that foolishness to them, some of them come around and recognize the wisdom. Look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made the, foolish and the, uh, the foolishness of wi the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Amen. For Jews request a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified Hallelujah. to the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ's the power of God 
and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Jump down to 27. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. I watched a guy rant and rage and, and, and other than the, the word Allah and Muhammad and the violence he was promoting, you'd have thought it was a Christian preacher. But I listened to him denigrate my Lord. I listened to him promote Muhammad. I listened to him encourage the Islamic community to destroy democracy and to bring about Sharia law. And, and, in fact, to destroy the infidels. I heard it from the man's mouth, being covered on the news. That's what's going out. That's what's out there. And we're fools. Really? A couple of years ago, Michael Card had a, a song out called God's Own Fool. Listen to the words. Seems I've imagined in him all my life as the wisest of all mankind. But if God's holy wisdom is foolish to man, he must have seemed out of his mind. For even his family said he was mad and the priests said a demon's to blame. But God in the form of this angry young man could not have seemed perfectly sane. So we follow God's fool for only the foolishness, the foolish can tell. Believe the unbelievable and come be a fool as well. When we, in our foolishness, thought we were wise, he played the fool and he opened our eyes. When we, in our weakness, believed we were strong, he became helpless to show we were wrong. And so we followed God's own fool, for only the foolish can tell. Believe the unbelievable and come be a fool as well. So come, lose your life for a carpenter's son, for a madman who died for a dream, and you'll have the faith his first followers had, and you'll feel the weight of the beam. So surrender the hunger and say you must know. Have the courage to say, I believe, for the power of paradox opens your eyes and blinds those who say they can see. When we in our foolishness thought we were wise, he played the fool to open our eyes. When we in our weakness believed we were strong, he became helpless to show we were wrong. And so we follow God's own fool, for only the foolish can tell, believe the unbelievable, and come be a fool as well. <laughs> I'm a fool. In fact, I'm a deplorable fool. <laughs> Beloved, the fact is, is that God knows best in all things. Romans chapter 16 and verse 20 tells us that he has put the devil under our feet. And God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. Now, some scriptures put soon. Well, soon being when Jesus died on the cross and you accept. You have no fear of Satan or his minions. And anything that happens in your life, God is permitting in your life. And sometimes it's hard. 
Sometimes it's downright tragic. Sometimes it bewilders us. We have to remember, we have to stay focused. Remember when I read Psalm 66 this morning? You cast us into the net. You let other men walk over our heads. You put us through the refining fire. Why? To bring us out to a richer fulfillment. I listen to some people who say that they are following Christ and they're preaching these gospels of, you know, prosperity. Oh, God's going to give you this and God's going to give you that and God's going to do this. You know what? God doesn't necessarily want you to have the best time here on earth. He wants you to have the best time for eternity. Matthew chapter 13, verse 58, Jesus is back in his hometown and they get angry with him. And it says, the, the, the saddest thing is, is that it says he could not do many things wonderful works there because of their unbelief. Because of their unbelief. Beloved, believing doesn't give us what we want, but unbelieving can keep us from what we need. It's not a question of what we want. It's a question of what does God want for us. And that should be the desire of our heart. You hear that quoted all the time, right? God will give you the desire of your heart. Yeah. If the desire of your heart is to live in the image of Christ... He's not going to give you just anything you want. Just like we wouldn't give our children any, just anything they want. Belief doesn't receive what it wants, but unbelief prevents what it needs to win. To win. To to actually come to the place where we can now stand firm in our confidence of God. Knowing from past experience, he's got it all in control. And we, yes, many times have been a fool. You know, I've been walking with God now for close to 40 years. And I started out and there were a number of people thought I was a fool. Through the first early years, a lot of those people continued to maintain that opinion. But now they don't. God, in his wisdom, bore himself out. And they see the changes in my life. They see the things, the changes in your life. Give them time. Now, the real worldly wise will never see it. Because they're blind. And that's a shame. But the ones that are looking for God, they'll spot it. They'll spot it like a beacon in sea. Coming up to land, he says, oh, there's that lighthouse, I see it now. Beloved, God wants the very best for you. And what that best is, we don't always know. We think we know. But we don't. So, you know, for an example, are you going through a a health struggle? You might be. Something challenging in your physical body. Look at, I'm I'm old enough now where there are physical challenges that I realize ain't never going to go away. (laughs) In fact, uh, if I neglect my responsibilities, they're going to get worse. Okay? But they're never going away. And that's okay. That's okay. Because I know where I'm going. 
and then these body aches and pains. And you know, listen, some people are going through health issues that are even worse. We have on our prayer thing a sister named Sue Hickman. When we were younger, her, their kids and our kids played together. Uh, and and uh, hung out together and did all kinds of things together. Came out on a boat with me and uh, and now they live in Missouri and she's going through some challenging health issues but our faith is strong and that faith, that belief actually gives her more mobility, less pain, more hope, more confidence, and a deep-seated joy. Certainly, she wants to come here and visit, and maybe they will this, in the next month. And she wants to see Boston and Plymouth before she dies. Not that they said she's gonna, but she could. And she's got a sweet spirit about her. Where does that come from? It's from that foolishness. See, she's just foolish enough. Hallelujah. Let me be a fool, Father. <laughs> but there are other struggles we have. Sometimes there are things going wrong in our careers. And we're so busy striving and, and worried about it that we don't necessarily recognize where God's leading us. No, no, no. Not this stack of branches, the rose bush. Not the stack, the rose bush. Get out of there. Go to the rose bush. But we don't see the rose bush. We see the stack of dead branches. That looks like a good spot right there. Let God lead you. Be a fool. Come on, get foolish with me. <laughs> Trust in him. Let the world think what they want. Trust in God. Let him guide you. There's something better. Oh, it might not pay as much. On the other hand, it may pay more. On the other hand, it may pay less. But you'll like doing it. <laughs> but you won't find it if you stay focused on this. One day, years ago, uh, somebody told me there was a Christian radio station. And so I figured, all right, well, I want to listen to this Christian radio. So I sat in my car by my boat, and I'm playing with the tuner. Remember the days when you had to play with the tuner? You know, a little <laughs> the thing to turn, right? And I'm playing with the tuner, and I'm trying to get it, trying to get it. But, see, the person told me a number that they thought it was at. And so I, I'm playing right around that number trying to tune it in. I'm raising my antenna. I'm lowering my antenna. I'm smacking my antenna. And I'm not getting this station in. You know what I did? I got so fed up, I just spun the dial. And it went all the way down to the last one on the, on the, the lower side, right? And there it was. <laughs> it wasn't clear. So I just kind of turned it a little bit and boom, there it was. But I heard the name Jesus after I spun that thing down. I, said, I don't care. <laughs> and there it was. And God's up in heaven going, why don't you just listen to me? <laughs> My point is this. You can't be tuned in to what God wants if you're spending all of your attention on what you want. And God, what God wants for you is better for you. Remember the first time I was going to go to church? We were, we were poor. We still owed a lot of money. I walked out of real estate owing a lot of money. I walked out of real estate more in debt than the mortgage on my house. And I went out fishing, went out on the bay. Little by little, we were paying them off, paying them off, paying them off, paying them off. Paying them off. 
Well, God's telling me go to that little white church. Why do, I, why do you want me to go to that little white church? You got to tithe. So what? I had a tithe. I said, God, I can't afford the tithe. And, and you know what he said to me? You can't afford not to tithe. You need my help, son. Honor me. You say you believe. Show me. Well, I didn't know what to say to my sweetheart. You know, and we were tight. Matter of fact, my fourth tithe check, and I wrote out checks because I wanted to take them off the IRS. Right? My fourth tithe check was for $2.10. That means I earned $21 for the week. But the first morning I got up to go to church, I'm gonna to go to church all by myself, I thought. Judy says, where are you going? Sunday morning, you don't get up early on Sunday morning. I said, I gotta to go to church. Well, you're gonna to go to church, for what? And I didn't even think, I said, I got a tithe. She said, what's tithe? I said, I have to give 10% of my income to the church. She was out of that bed <laughs> like somebody shot her out of a cannon, okay? She said, you got to what? I said, I got to give 10% of what I earn to the church. They, they don't need it. And she went on with everything, and it didn't matter. All that mattered was I don't care what they do with it. I don't care if they need it. What, what's important is that I'm obedient to him, I said to her. Well, she starts getting dressed. I said, what are you doing? She said, I'm going with you. If, you'll give the house away. Do you know that was the only Sunday that everything went smooth in our house to get to church? I'm telling you, we were sitting out in, the church, in front of the church 15 minutes early. We were there before the pastor. And I was scared to death. How many times I've had people say, I can't tithe. Well, then don't expect God to help you with your finances. Are you going to be a fool or not? I'm a fool. And I've never regretted it. So what's this all about? Let's wrap this up. By the way, with the, we're gonna, you notice we didn't take an offering. We're going to take the offering now. Going to be a fool? <laughs> or not? <laughs> Duh. <laughs> I'm just a fool for Jesus. And I'm glad I am. Amen. Amen. Do you want to know something? I, I found myself awestruck by what God did because I obeyed him. Yes, in tithing. But I wanted to be under water. I didn't want to be a pastor. I wanted to be on the water. I like being on the water. My son, my grandsons, my daughter-in-law, we're all on the water. That's a wonderful life. For me, is what I thought. And God destroyed an entire industry. That's the way I look at it. To force me to become a pastor. Man, am I glad I'm a fool for Christ. Because as good as I thought that was, this is better. This is much better. This is what I was created for. This is what I was formed in my mother's womb for. I'm not the best preacher. I'm not the best pastor. But I couldn't do anything better because this is who I am. Hallelujah, I'm a fool for Jesus. He got me out of that. He, so he did it in my finances. He did it in my occupation. And, and, and he did it in my health.
the winter of 1979. It snowed like crazy down there. And my car, my boat battery, I had to make my way. We got 29 inches of snow in one night on top of snow that we had and I had to get to the boat because I knew my boat would go down. Now I'm gonna make this real quick. It, it was going down. The, the outlet for the, the, the uh, bilge pump was below water and the battery was dead. In fact, the battery was in a plastic case and was floating. I jumped on the boat, I grabbed that battery, and I ran through the snow, mid-thigh, through the snow, from here to Mary Lou's. Started my car up and switched the batteries, took the car battery and put it in that plastic case and ran back to the boat and stood in water up to my knees to hook up the battery to get that pump going then jumped out onto the deck and started shoveling the snow off the deck. After I got done with that, the battery in the boat was doing okay still, so I walked back to the car. And as I started to walk back to the car, I sat in my car and it was running. And suddenly it was like somebody put vice grip of my neck and under my arms and behind my elbows and the back of my knees everything oh it ached so bad oh, I said God this is it I'm gonna die I know it's a heartache a heart attack you you take care of my family and I put my head back and said please let me pass out and I did the next thing I hear it's my buddy, Bill Forster. You okay, man? You okay? I woke up, no more pain. Car's still running. I looked over to see if the boat was still floating. Quick jumped up, grabbed the battery. I, grabbed, I said, look, I got to go change the batteries, you know. He said, I got an extra battery. And we trudged through the snow again. Changed, put his battery in, brought that battery back. And that was the end of it. Three years later, a fellow comes to church who was burnt in a fire so bad. 80% of his body, third degree burns. He said, but the worst part was the heart attack. One after another. I said, John, what did they feel like? He described what I felt exactly so the next time I went to the doctor, I told the doctor, he said, you had a heart attack. He said, we gotta check you out, you know. He said, because part, parts of the, the heart will die and now you gotta be careful. So I ran this battery of tests. No damage at all. But I do have arthritis and a weight problem. <laughs> and a few other things that God helps me with. Beloved, as the men come forward for the offering, and uh, we're gonna close in a song. The Holy Spirit touches us, beloved, and helps us. The Holy Spirit is the one that provides us with all we need to be a fool, a fool for Christ. Praise God.